part-built Stuart James Coombs table engine. This is a good example of a part-built model steam engine, but it's not as good as it looked when I first saw it. This video shows the engine in close-up detail. This clip shows the cylinder and the steam chest, and the steam chest is fitted upside down. The part below the cylinder is the valve operating arm. To the left is the eccentric strap and the metal to make the eccentric sheave from. Let's take a look at the cylinder. There are one or two things wrong with this cylinder in my opinion. The steam chest only fits one way round, and the way it fits is upside down. This steam cylinder is the same as the one on a Stuart Victoria. Here's a picture of my Stuart Victoria to verify that. It's also the same cylinder casting that is used in the Stuart beam engine. I haven't really figured out what's going on here, because the steam chest only fits the wrong way round, not the right way round. And when I reverse the steam chest, still the wrong way round, it doesn't fit either. I don't quite get this, because the machining standard of these parts is very good. I don't think this is a problem though, because it's just a case of running a slightly oversized drill through the holes in the steam chest. That would allow the steam chest to be fitted any way round. Because as I've just said, the machining quality is quite good. It's just a little bit on the tight side. It's not a good idea around a steam cylinder for parts to be tight. It's best to leave some tolerance for expansion and contraction as the part heats up and cools down. Here's the piston, fitted with two cast iron rings, and I think this tells me that this is an old engine. The Stuart Victoria steam engine that I'm building came with a Viton O-ring, not two cast iron rings. It was easy enough to insert the piston into the cylinder, but have a look at this. I don't know what is shown on the drawing, but as you can see, the hole in the side of the cylinder wall that connects to the drain cock is a bit low down in the cylinder. This makes the drain cocks completely ineffective because the drain cock hole needs to be as high up or as low down in the cylinder as possible in order to prevent hydraulic lock at each end of the piston stroke. As you can see, both of the drain cocks look okay and they follow the casting, but really that's not the best way to do it. If you're going to fit the drain cocks so low in the casting, then the hole needs to be drilled at an angle to reach the top of the cylinder, not where it is now. How did I come across this engine and what am I doing with it? Well initially I'm just looking at it because I bought it from Simon at the steam workshop. Then he phoned me back and said, I've made a mistake, it doesn't belong to me. And initially I said, well if it's complete I can put it together and it will make a good video series. But unfortunately it's far from complete and there are problems. And so far I've not been able to contact the owner of the engine to discuss things with him. Some parts of this engine are very nicely made and others are not. Did two people work on this? I'm really not sure. There's something wrong somewhere and I can't put my finger on it. I can see the problem with the pulley. That was drilled the wrong size and then it's been sleeved to take it down to the size that the crankshaft is supposed to be. Generally when I build these kind of engines I make the crankshaft half an inch diameter all the way through. The main bearings are quite nicely made Although when I look closely at these bearings, one of them seems to have been sat in some water. Yet the other parts don't seem to be particularly rusty. The flywheel is exactly the same size as the one fitted to my Stuart Victoria, except the one of my Stuart Victoria is much older. This is the newer design of Stuart flywheel, with the fancy square bits by the spokes. The crankshaft, crank web and the small part of the connecting rod seem to be fine. The metal base onto which the box bed and pedestal mount is a bit scruffy, I don't know what's going on here. I'd have used a better piece of metal, I think. The upper part of this engine sits on the top of four steel posts, and look at the state of this one. It looks to me like this has been very rusty at some time in its history after it was turned, and then it's been shot blasted to remove the rust, and this is the pitting left by the process. The box bed itself is painted blue and although the paint's chipped, that's not rusty at all. With the engine were a set of photographs, but you couldn't really see them as they were all stuck together. They weren't photographs of this engine, just a similar engine that was completely finished and the cylinder was clad in mahogany. And in the photograph, the engine was painted blue, almost the same shade of blue as this. 
What I'm going to do is partially assemble the engine to see how many parts are damaged, how many parts are incomplete and how many parts are missing altogether. Here are the parts for the connecting rod which is quite special on these engines but the centre peg is not a good fit in the hole. Plus the hole in the crossbar hasn't been counterbored to accept the shaft. I would have to check the drawing's dimensions to make sure that by counterboring this it didn't change the geometry of the connecting rod. The length of the connecting rod overall is critical and this connecting rod is made of three separate pieces. Here's a shot of the main bearings in their approximate position and the good news is these castings seem to have been machined OK. Although you can't see it very clearly in this image, the two rounded steel blocks at the top of the columns, which support the rocking shaft to operate the valve system, are very badly pitted indeed and once again look like they've been shot blasted. This all seems to me like parts of this engine have been stored in a very wet environment. It's not the end of the world and it's fixable, but it's going to take time. I definitely think I would make four new support columns because these just don't look right. And I don't just mean the one that's been shot blasted, they just don't all look the same. As I said earlier, the original plan when Simon told me he sold it by mistake was to make a video assembling the pre-machine kit, but this really is nowhere near a pre-machine kit. It's not that bad, I've seen a lot worse in my time, but the accumulation of problems means that it would take a lot longer than I initially would estimate to assemble a pre-machine kit. When I paid for this engine, I was quite pleased with Simon's asking price. We didn't haggle, that was it, but then, of course, he forgot it wasn't his. So I'm in limbo at the moment, I don't know how to proceed. This video is OK, it's showing you how the engine goes together and what there is and this, that and the other. But as for assembling it just for the video, free of charge, I don't think so. There's far too much work to do. Even the drive belt to drive the governor is very rusty and it's in a very prominent place on the engine, so that needs replacing. It's not all bad news, though. There is a book which tells you how to build this engine and it's called Building the James Coombs Table Engine. And also with the engine are a full set of drawings, which is quite useful. It will remain to be seen whether there is an episode 2 in this series. It all depends what happens when I speak to the owner of these engine parts. I don't have the time to spend many, many hours on an engine such as this, so I really think that the best place for it for the moment is back in the box. But I will keep you posted. And that concludes this inspection of the parts of a Stuart James Coombs engine. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.